One of the primary items that probably comes to mind when you're thinking about shark tagging would be the actual tag for the shark. One of the major tags we use is called the satellite tag. Now this tag actually gives us the shark's location in near real time. This is attached to the dorsal fin of a shark. We save these tags for sharks that usually move long distances or sharks whose dorsal fins break the surface often. In order to transmit, this tag's antenna actually has to be dry for a couple seconds. So this is really good for species like tiger sharks, like blue sharks, like great whites that are gonna travel long distances and they're also gonna stay near the surface for a lot of that time. So every time this antenna breaks the surface of the water, if it's out there for more than a couple seconds, once it's dry, it'll start communicating with the GPS satellite, sending it its location, and it'll actually email the GPS coordinates to our team from which we can build a map and then follow their movements. The other, another primary tag we use is called a dart tag. Now this is the tag that we use on almost every shark every day, and it's not what most people think of when they think of shark tagging. They think of being able to actively track the shark, but those tags are very expensive and require a lot of money and effort to put out. So these tags go in every single shark, and this is a dart tag that has a little ID number on it, and it helps us because it gives each shark a little name code that we can use to identify their samples, to relate it to other sharks, and organize our data with. These tags also are given to us by NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, by their fisheries department. And this is part of their cooperative tagging program. So each tag has information on the inside to call NOAA if you've reported the shark again and report its length. And every time we tag a shark with this tag, we fill out this little postcard with the species, the date, the location of where we caught the shark, how big it was, what sex it is. And we send this to NOAA, and NOAA is compiling these from researchers from all over the U.S. and also from recreational fishermen that catch sharks all over the U.S. And they can use this to compile a large database on the sharks that are out there. We also have a spaghetti tag, which is a much smaller type of tag, and it's very similar to the dark tag. They're both mark recapture tags, but their main purpose is just to let us know that we've caught the shark before and to give it the ID number. This one has a much shorter number, and this does not have information for NOAA. This is just for our lab, but it does have our phone number on it, so if someone catches our shark again, we do ask if they call us and they let us know where they caught it, how big it is, and then we can look back in our data and we can see where it's been since we last caught it and hopefully how much it's grown as well. So we're going to have different procedures when we tag different sharks. If we catch a nurse shark, for instance, we're going to bring that onto our boat. And we do that mostly because it's a very hardy species. We don't put a pump in their mouths to pump water through their gills. They don't actually have to be swimming to pull water over their gills. They're known as buccal pumpers and are able to get oxygen as long as we keep those gills wet. One special case is going to be the great hammerhead. The species has been found to have high susceptibility to stress when they're on the line. So when we catch a great hammerhead, we pull it to the side of the boat, we don't actually put it on the platform. And we will make that process as fast as possible. We'll take a couple length measurements, not even a blood sample, maybe a fin clip. We'll put a tag on the shark to identify it, and then we'll send it on its way. For my project specifically, with acoustic tags or transmitters, for hammerheads, what we'll do is we'll attach it to the dorsal fin. That way we can reduce the amount of stress the shark goes through. That's going to be different from a nurse shark, since they're a very hardy species. We'll actually make an incision into their body cavity, put the tag in there, and then sew that up. The acoustic transmitter acts kind of like a Morse code. It gives off a set of 8 to 10 pings, and whenever a shark comes within a certain distance of an acoustic receiver, that acoustic receiver will be listening for those pings. And if it picks up all those pings and the right intonations, it's going to be able to say whether or not shark 1234 was there. So in terms of our project in Biscayne Bay, we have about 40 receivers that are located from the highly urban center of Miami all the way down through Biscayne National Park down towards the Everglades. So you go from an urban area all the way down to a rural area and it creates this sort of urban gradient where you have receivers in highly impacted areas, meaning highly impacted by human activity, such as fishing, boat activity, etc. And you go all the way down to a rural area that's less so impacted. 
we're actually finding that a lot of the sharks that we're acoustically tagging are being detected around the city center, so specifically just off the coast of Brickell Key, and even in Port Miami and Government Cut where there's a lot of boat activity. In terms of the species that we're detecting, we do detect a lot of bull sharks around the urban center. I'd say about out of 22 bull sharks that we've acoustically tagged, we've heard from about 16 of them in Biscayne Bay. In terms of nurse sharks, we're getting a lot of detections from underneath Bear Cut Bridge, which is just right next to our school. There's a couple of nurse sharks that like to hang out there a lot and pretty much spend their entire time in that area. We also get a lot of detections from great hammerheads. There's one great hammerhead in particular that has been detected all across Biscayne Bay. 